Well, hello, everybody. This is Tim Green with Rattle Magazine. Welcome to Rattlecast number 57, another excellent show on the line for you. We have Alejandro Escudé. We'll be joining him in just a minute. But before we begin, I should say that Rattle is a publication of the Rattle Foundation, a 501c3 nonprofit working to promote the practice of poetry. We've been in continuous publication since 1995 and are only affiliated with any other organization. We just do it because we love poetry. And if you love poetry, please click the like button right now. Don't wait because you'll forget. I always forget, uh, but it really helps if you click the like button and uh, share. And make sure you're subscribed and uh, make sure you click the notification bell too if you're watching on YouTube. Wherever it is you're watching, there's some way to click and tell people you're watching. And that is always a good thing. Now, for a warm-up poem today, um, I just clicked the random button, which actually works now. Um, if you haven't noticed, for the last almost, I think, nine months, we had an upgrade for our server at rattle.com. And um, the, the random button was caching, so you only got one random poem per hour. And I've tried so long to fix this. And um, the weird thing is, suddenly it works. So I think the way that I fixed it a couple weeks ago that I tried, I actually corrected it. And um, once the cache cleared, now it works again or something like that. So the random button works. You can click on random poem after poem now, which is like we always intended. So I clicked on the random button and I uh, came up with this poem by Kathleen Postma, uh, Four Women in a Hot Tub. We lowered ourselves in. Let me start over. We lowered ourselves in, our suits stretched by fat that had collected all winter like set sediment. We smoked pot and someone said something profound, but it wasn't me. I rolled like a detached fetus in the water and wondered about the electrical wires that ran beneath us like veins that don't age so much as blow out. One woman said all she still wanted was fame, but we knew it was too late for her. Let's talk about something happy, she said. No calamities in China or women getting screwed or chemotherapy. She went first. She said her son had made a friend after being alone all school year. The next woman said her backyard had caught the first light after weeks of rain. Her children were illuminated as they dug in the mud. The next said she opened the, her door to find a kind, of, a kind letter from a man she left ten years ago. The last woman asked, when did happiness become merely a reprieve? Like a blizzard letting up after a night on Everest, or an iffy remission after chemotherapy. In the hot tub, we slid laterally. We circled to the right, so we each got a turn with the most brutal jets that would, time willing, break us out of our skin into something larger and more forgiving than ourselves. That was Kathleen Postma um, with her poem from Medal Number 33, which is one of those, I haven't thought of this poem in a long, long time. That was a really good one. Four Women in, four women in a Hot Tub. And um, Kathleen Postma, I had to look her up, but she um, is a professor of creative writing at um, Pacific University. And uh, since publishing here, uh, her essay, Becoming Foreign, about experiences living in China and Turkey, has been cited in Best American Travel Writing. So that is Kathleen Postma. So check her out when you can, and uh, check out Rattle Number 33 when you can. Now, as I mentioned, today's guest is Alejandro Escudé. And um, Alejandro, I was looking this up, and he might be the um, most frequently published poet we have at Rattle. I, I didn't notice, but he, um, we published him in six issues of Rattle, and uh, including an interview in Rattle number 59, but then eight times in Poets Respond, which might be a record. He's one of those poets that submits most weeks, he submits a poem. And um, so that's how I know there's always going to be something good, um, is Alejandro will be having a poem. Um, he's also the public, um, the author of My Earthbound Eye, which won the 2012 Sacramento Poetry Center Award. Um, and his newest book is, uh, The Book of the Unclaimed Dead, which is right here. And, um, here he is, Alejandro Escudé. Hey Alejandro, how you doing? Pretty good. How are you, Tim? Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, it's always my pleasure. I mean, we've had you like... We do everything with you, so um, it's good to see you again. You were, I saw you last at the, was that the Literary Festival two years ago or last year? It was, I think, two years now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. time just flies, man. And then there's yeah. no Literary Festival. It would be, right now, I would be freaking out about um, getting that thing organized. Uh, but but now, there's, thanks to the pandemic, I guess it's a silver lining or something. I don't have to worry about it. Yeah, there's 
always silver linings to those things. <laughs> so how you been doing? Now, one thing I didn't mention in your bio is that you're a teacher and you're doing, um, you're struggling through the um, California at least has all distance learning. I think. Mm. Um, yeah. So, yeah, so, pretty much. so how is that going for you as a teacher? Like, what's your perspective? A lot of people, we've had a lot of poems like in Poets Respond about this from parents with their kids. Um, mm. And um, we've read them here on Poets Respond Live and from teachers too. So, so what's your perspective on um, the distance learning? Do you think it's productive or, or is it hard? How is it going? Yeah, I think it, I think there, I think it benefits uh, both students and teachers in different ways. It's like, you know, for students who needed a, a sort of, you know, social break. <laughs> Interesting. I mean, high, high school is horrible, man. <laughs> it is. You know, like, you're, it, it's still like, it's still high school, you know, and I think they get a break a little bit. Um, maybe. Hmm. I don't know. I think, I think after a while it kind of wears out even the introverts, you know, like even the introverts are like, I wish I had a friend, you know. Yeah, well, I bet, um, yeah. But I think for... For teachers, like I was telling you, I think you get to focus on that part of teaching, which is more planning uh, and, um, you know, what high school teachers call scope and sequence, which is like, you know, what's what's your year going to look like? I think some teachers were able to do that and classroom management very well. I mean, those are like masters, you know, mm -hmm. but I always struggled with the classroom management part and the planning. Uh, and, uh, you know, making sure my lessons were t tip top and all of that. So now I get to do the part that always was on the back burner. Um, I, I felt like I was just kind of surviving. Yeah. One thing. So maybe some, yeah. Yeah. One thing we noticed, um, is just, there's a lot more one-on-one, -on -one, it seems anyway, time with the mm -hmm. teacher. They have these, um, for our school anyway, they have like an hour set up for, um, teaching every day. Yeah. And then yeah. there's like these slots where students who are having trouble can get one-on-one -on -one instruction. And um, that seems really helpful. I don't know if that's the same thing for your class, but it seems like there's sort of a way it's, I, don't, I just wonder if this whole, whole thing is going to completely change the way school is done. Like, like, you know, a lot of the things, the way school um, was structured was based on the, um, with the general education board from Rockefeller like 120 years ago. And um, yeah, to, to yeah. teach farmers, basically, how to work in factories was the point. And um, we still yeah. do so much out of habit. I wonder if now we'll end up with, like, a hybrid forever or something, you know? Do you think that's going to change, or do you think everybody's going to go back to how they were doing it before? Yeah, I, I think so. I, I, I don't think anything's going to be the same after this. Um, well, more or less. I, I think it's going to affect it uh, a little, you know, at least a, a bit, I would say. You know, ten percent of everything we do—sports, uh, school—everything uh, will be changed somewhat. Technology, but I, I don't think it's going to be like a complete turnaround. I think once we go back, everybody will be like, yeah. you know, the, there'll be like a little renaissance of like you know, the 1992. You know, I don't know, <laughs> um, but I do think schools will change. I think uh, technology. I mean, uh, the, the the kind of bad thing is that. I mean, for teachers, you know, if you go out for a job, they're going to expect you to be technology wise, you know, like they're, you know, forget about this, like being special because you can, <laughs> you can do a, a online learning, you know, like everybody's going to be, have that skill. Yeah. That's how I felt like, I kind of um, felt like, um, the pandemic stole my thunder a little bit because, um, a year yeah. ago I was the only one doing, um, like live stream inner, you know, poetry stuff. And yeah. I thought, like, wow, this is so cool and revolutionary. And now uh, everybody yeah. does Zoom readings. It's all it's, over, man. <laughs> yeah, so, so now I have to actually somehow be entertaining, which I don't know. You know, that's not within my capability. <laughs> I think you, you, you got to work on being like the Elon Musk of poetry. Uh, that's now. what I try to do. <laughs> yeah, I got to get the, the boring company going. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, so, do you want to read a poem before we, um, you know, keep talking yeah. a little bit? And I should say, too, if anybody has any questions for Alex as we go through, um, just leave them in the chat windows on either Facebook or YouTube, and I will pass them along. But let's let's hear a poem from whatever you want. Just let me know the book and page number. We have two of them here. Okay. Um, the latest book, uh, the book of the Unclaimed Dead, uh, to go with our little technology theme, um, I, I wrote a poem called The Poet's Ancient Cursor, and it was kind of a sci-fi story um, made into a poem which I, I have dabbled into writing little sci-fi stories uh, or speculative. And uh, so 
this this is the poet's ancient cursor. It's on page twenty five. So the sunny streets are not set in the current time. They are time lapsed, so that the neighbor swinging a golf club on his fake grass is doing so ten years ago. My computer is poised to ram itself through the window. A cord awaits to be pulled out of its socket. The whole trailing mess sucked toward the end of the solar system. There, a camera records the entire episode. A bomb disposal robot will inspect the landing site in about 300 years before a troop of scientists explorers excavate the site. They will find a hole emitting a noxious gas and finally the screen, at which time they will give each other a thumbs up. The keyboard next, followed by the rest of the cords, the power strip, nestled together like a nest of rattlesnakes. Most of the apparatus will be useless, just a shell, each component a mashed, misshapen mass, buried ten feet from the surface. But it will be enough to learn about this time. Enough to study the habits of a poet from the early 21st century. As a fragment of the hard drive is restored and rebooted, much to the delight of the explorers who brought it back, they will find poems written in a cartoonish font in a folder labeled just for fun. Other poems in the file ready. The rest of the stuff will be made of financial PDFs, assorted JPEGs. The pics unrecoverable. Their download impossible. They will study these artifacts for a long time. Each poem a time capsule. Each phrase, each line, another insight. They will wonder how the computer reached the end of the solar system. They will ponder how it suddenly became propelled that fast. And how it possibly survived. And at night, after the scientists... Oh, I'm sorry, that far. And how it possibly survived. And at night, after the scientists turn off their sensors, they will be amazed by the one remaining blinking cursor in the, corner, in the center of the screen. At first they thought it was a chip or fleck of radioactive, radioactive material. Then they saw it blink, and it never stops. This is where we are today. Very interesting. That was uh, The Poet's Ancient Cursor uh, by Alejandro Escudé from the Book of the Unclaimed Dead. And um, I wanted to frame our interview a little bit, but let's just start going kind of deep in the poetry. Do you think uh, robots will ever write poems? Um, I, was, I was just looking at this today. Um, everybody yeah. can check it out. Did you see this article in The Guardian where they took the new AI um, speech writing program and they asked to write an article... Um, you know, explaining how or, or why we shouldn't fear our um, AI overlords because they come in peace or whatever. And so this whole article in The Guardian was written by a robot. <laughs> Do you, wow. And, and yeah. it was like, it was that Uncanny Valley thing where it was like, yeah. it was like freaky. Like knowing that the robot, you know, that the computer like didn't yeah. know what it was saying, but then still made sense anyway, was just so like... It was, it was, I felt like I was in a dark yeah. mirror, black mirror episode. Um. I, I think you just defined poetry. Yeah. <laughs> it didn't know what it was saying, but it, you, but it wrote it anyway. Yeah. You know, like. Oh, that's a good point. Yeah. Maybe they're like the, they're like the savants of poetry is the AI that's yeah. completely clueless. Hey, why not, man? Yeah. <laughs> so, I don't know. I think, I think it, it's, it's like, there's something about the, the it would have to you know that kind of um moment in like 2001 a space odyssey you know how when it like reaches consciousness you know and it, 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 it's that moment where it can uh accept this sort of randomness you know of its of its existence or <laughs> and then and then it'll write good poems yeah you know? yeah but it has to get to that point you know <laughs> otherwise it's going to be like an undergraduate you know like <laughs> Yeah, it means a you know it's existential crisis. Once AI has the existential yeah. crisis, then we'll have to yeah, um, or, yeah. yeah, or discovers that parallel parallelogram, you know, in, in you know, in that planet or whatever, <laughs> you know, that it gets there. You know? Yeah, yeah, um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I've, have you seen those? There's that. The other thing, this thing is like 15 years old, maybe that bot or not. And they've, they've had a, a computer writing poems for like 15 years or so. And there's a website you can go to. I think it's just called botornot.com. And they'll have like an Emily Dixon poem with no author on there. And they'll have a robot poem. And you have to vote whether it's um, who do you think did it. Um, 
Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. I, I, I would love that. That would, that would like, keep me entertained for a long time. Yeah, time. it's kind of tough to, you know, to tell this between a robot and, like, John Ashbery, because the robot, like, oh my God. you know, jumps yeah, between yeah. all these images. Um, that's a lot what of... Am I- just named one of my you know my gods in uh you know influence big influence <laughs> yeah. so, okay so now let's step back and just uh, do you want to tell everybody about um about how you came into poetry and and you you uh, were born in argentina then came out here then mm-hmm. um and became a newspaper reporter for a while I, i'm just remembering from the interview and then um yeah and then became a poet so how did that all happen like why are you sitting here at uh, 6 p.m on, on in la doing a poetry podcast how did that come to happen yeah, it's, uh, you know, it started just kind of uh, the way people, I think most people, you know, I don't know, maybe not most, but in an English class, I, we were reading T.S. Eliot, you know, the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock, um, and I fell in love with whatever that was, you know. Uh, I recognized right away that it was very different than the other poetry we were made to read, you know. It wasn't John Donne, you know, it wasn't... Um, Shakespeare. Uh, This was T.S. Eliot was talking about something else and something I I, even at that age I think I recognized which was you know kind of uh, being isolated. Uh, That that poem is about isolation you know it's got heavy that that, that theme and I think I recognized it but I didn't know you know and then I think right after that I wrote my first poem um, about some girl I liked I think. (laughs) Obviously, you know, it's like the common thing to do. And then uh, in college, I wrote my first and published my first poem. In freshman year of college, it's at UC Santa Cruz. And it was a poem about the ocean. <laughs> uh, yeah, I won't even like say the title. Uh, but yeah, it was, it was a and then I published there. And I remember just liking being published because it came out in the newspaper. And I found it, uh, you know, in a college, uh, Santa Cruz has thousands like three uh you know seven or eight colleges and i was just walking by and there's a newspaper with me and you know i I knew it was going to come out but i didn't for some reason it still surprised me and uh i think i was hooked on poetry then publishing at the same time Mm -hmm. and that's why i got into the newspaper and i loved writing feature stories uh so i like to write uh and i got better you know uh that year that i worked full-time as a reporter, I did work a long time as a reporter, just about a year at a community newspaper, you know, getting paid nothing. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was at Brentwood, actually, Brentwood uh, News. And so I reported on, you know, I got to see the, the Lewinsky thing way back when and, and all of that. Um, but I would mostly interview like bankers and city hall, uh, city council members and, you know, about pavement projects and <laughs> things like yeah. that. But I tried to make those poetic, you know. I would try to. I, I I did. I did write a story, breaking the 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 beginning of the Getty, the Getty Villa, and I remember really loving writing that, describing the the you know what it was going to look like. And so I made. I'm you know dating myself here, but um, <laughs> yeah. What, what did yeah. your editors think of um, inserting poetry into? Um, did they did they enjoy it or not? Because I I do a column um, for the Riverside uh, Press or what's it called, the Press Enterprise in Riverside. And I'm always trying to push sort of like their boundaries and their buttons a little bit. Like it's a literary yeah, column. Yeah. But a, yeah, a lot yeah. of times they come back and they're like, you cannot, pu- we're not going to publish this. You got to write it. Like, <laughs> That's awesome. like yeah. I wrote one that was like um, for National Poetry Month, which I hate. Um, yeah. I, I wrote some a column about how um, um, it's really important to eat your broccoli. And that's all it was. <laughs> And at the end, it just said like, like poetry is not broccoli, and they were like, um, "Yeah, we can't publish that. That doesn't make any sense." <laughs> I love that. Um, yeah. Did Did you do yeah. that? And did you Did you piss your editors off? You know, I I remember writing stuff. This is going to sound vain, and I don't care. I remember writing stuff that I was like, "This is this is good," you know. And it, it you know it was a community newspaper, and I think I wanted an award, you know, like, and they were like. Oh well, good article on the on the the, the bikes, you know. I, I, <laughs> like, I would write about an article about the, a group of people who biked, you know, who were French, you know, and they were like, you know, elite, you know, bikers, 
but I would make it really cool and poetic and stuff. And they were just like, oh, cool. All right. Nice. All right. I didn't know they were around, you know? <laughs> so, like, it really went over their head, you know? And sometimes I would uh, exaggerate or, you know, I would do illegal things. Like, for a journalist, like, I would put words into people's mouths, oh, really? you know, if it was better. <laughs> have you ever, and, 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 have you ever yeah. confessed this uh, before? Or is this the first time you're coming out? Is a... You know what? I, I think I did it without even noticing. Mm-hmm. Like, I think that my mind said, yeah, that's what they said. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what, you know, Patricia Smith, uh, we talked about this in her interview in uh, issue number 27, but she was a journalist. And she yeah. that's how she le- had to leave journalism because she was um, sort of, as a poet would do, like taking like four different people and mixing up into one really good commentary person instead of, you know, because it just makes a better story, I think. Yeah, and, um, I don't think I was that bad. Yeah. I, I wasn't that bad. Like I would, I would change like one word, like by accident. I once had this one, one old, old, older woman. She's like, "I didn't say I was giddy, you know." And I said, oh, but giddy's a good word," you know. <laughs> <laughs> and like, or or I would really exaggerate uh, description, mm-hmm. you know, like uh, like if I was describing an event or something, and I knew that it was you know way over the top, but uh, something like that. But I was never too. I was always a little bit. Uh, very respectful of that genre, you know, because I, I kind of knew back then it was dying. Mm-hmm. Like, like we were getting really biased and we were getting really uh, stupid, like, like just Fox News. I mean, it was, it was happening. And so I was like, you know, maybe I should go to journalism school and do this, you know, because I really kind of feel for mm-hmm. it. Uh, and I tried to get a job at the LA Times, but I wasn't hired. Yeah. So I think if I was hired, I would have been a a, a newspaper reporter until <laughs> until it was over forever. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. the thing. It seems like journalism is over. Like the the it, it it's not even a, a symptom of anything except for like market forces. And um, oh, it died. Yeah, yeah it died. and then died. and then you know Fox News developed that model of of being really really slanted on one side and then everybody yeah. else has to pick up that model just to compete is like a survival of the fittest thing. And it's just, yeah, no. And, no. and I, I, you know, I try to teach my students that I taught an AP Lang class where it was, uh, you know, Truman Capote, uh, you know, um, that kind of style of journalism that was still sort of you, but you're telling the truth at the same time, you know? Um, so I don't know. I, 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 I've, I think that my poetry has a journalistic aspect uh, where I, that's why Poets Respond works for me because I'm still into the news, you know, mm-hmm. I'm still into like world events, uh, but, but with Poets Respond, I can, I can, you know, write about it however I want, you know, and still kind of stay true, but in my poetic way, you know, mm-hmm. so, but I think that that's where the draw comes in. Um so, so Caitlin uh, Buxbaum here asks um, why I hate National Poetry Month. But let me ask, let me turn it into a question. Do you like National, as a teacher, it sort of gives you an excuse, right, to focus on poetry for the month of April. Um, how do you feel about National Poetry Month? And then I'll, I'll tell you, I'll explain why I don't like it. <laughs> I don't know. It, you know, coming from, this is going to sound bad, but coming from high school, English, um, poetry doesn't seem... You know, when you talk about poetry the way we do, Mm -hmm. it doesn't seem like it's that part of that world. So I always feel like I'm doing something, uh, you know, kind of wrong uh, because I'm not giving the kids exactly what they need. You know, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think. Oh, you're. Your batteries ran out. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. That's okay. You can hear me, though. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I think they, they don't get, you know, what poetry is right now. Um, so in terms of like a national poetry month, you know, I try to bring in poets that I think are not like, like a John Ashbery poem, Mm -hmm. you know, I, I actually bring that into one of my classes. Um, but you won't find John Ashbery in, in all the stuff they need to do, you know, it's still kind of canon. Um, so a national poetry month to me, it's, it kind of just flies by and I, I don't really notice. Plus, like I said, it's such a, you're so busy. Um, that it feels like you can't stop and, you know, honor some kind of thing like that. Um, so I, to me, it really just doesn't really matter, mm-hmm. you know, plus I live, I, you know, it's going to sound again, like, you know, I'm just a poet all the time, but I just, I live poetry every day. I, you know, I write it every day. I, I read it every day, um, in some way. Uh, so for me, national poetry month, like saying, you know, uh, national human being month, you know, I, I just, I, I really don't, um, it's such a big thing in my life. 
And then for sharing it with my kids, I think I just, if it doesn't fall in that month, I won't do it. You know, maybe we're reading Frankenstein. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. they used to send posters. I like the posters. You know? Yeah, well, I just think that, that poetry is a really subversive art. You know, like everybody who yeah. falls in love with poetry does it because they weren't supposed to in a way. You know, like there's something that like connected with you in this private, powerful way. That the, I yeah. just think the marketing of it as something that's like you should do is, is not a mm-hmm. successful way to actually engage with it because it's not what it is. Um, it, it's it's no. it's yeah. it's just so different from that, and, it, and it's marketed in a way that's like um, um, I think is it Robert Peake maybe has an essay about this, but he talks about um, the, the difference between marketing candy versus marketing vitamins. And, yeah. um, and it's like yeah. marketed it in a way that's like, don't forget to eat your vitamins. And, uh, instead of, <laughs> it should be like marketed as, Hey, don't eat this candy kids. <laughs> you know? yeah. Like that's bad for you. And that, and that's actually the draw kind of, is it, this is like this, this private, um, powerful thing that like nobody else can do. Like, that's what poetry is. Like everybody I talk to, there's a poem like proof rock where they just connected with yeah. on this private personal level. And you can't be spoon fed it like it's something that you're supposed to do and have it connect, I don't think. Yeah, and I think when you try to explain that to people, because I tried to explain that to my colleagues one time, because they were trying to do this, um, uh, oh, what's that called? The uh, poet, slam mm-hmm. poet, like slam poetry. And they were trying to do it as like, it's going to be great for the kids. They get to express themselves. And, and I said, well, as long as it's like good. <laughs> <laughs> and I and I had like some standards, you know, and you know, like for like they, it can't just be a rant, you know. And uh, I, I just hate that feeling of watching somebody rant and then everybody applauds. Mm-hmm. I just hate that feeling. It's so inauthentic to me, you know. I said they just yelled, you know, they just screamed and yelled, and um, you know, because that same kid, unfortunately, you know, I, I hate to be the negative Nancy here, but like that same kid is also not going to listen to when I talk about Emily Dickinson, mm-hmm. you know. The kid ranted very well, you know. Uh, he was just happy to rant. That's fine. I think there is a space for that. But I ex- I tried to explain to my colleagues that look, I'm not going to be into it because I you know I can't help you there. You know I, I, that's just not me. I um, I think you know not to not to put down slam poetry though. But the way they were going to do it in high school was something I thought was inauthentic. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, I think it's 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 something that um, it's just hard to explain. And you come off as an elitist, and and I'm like, no, no, you don't know what elite. It's not elitism. That's further. That's not, you know, I can explain to you what elitism is in poetry, and it's not that. So um, I I think it's very, it's just very hard to explain, you know. Uh, But some kids, you know, I teach creative writing right now, too, in high school. And I can already see some kids who have uh, not, you know, people would want to say talent and stuff. I think it's just a kind of, um, a drive toward okay, I get this. I'm playing with words, you know, and they're sort of having fun with it, you know. And when I say something like I like this line, they're like, yeah, I kind of get why you do. <laughs> you know? and, and those are the kids who are going to be sort of seduced, you know, into it, mm-hmm. and then are going to maybe going into an MFA or something like that, which, which I think is good. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I totally agree. Now, do you want to keep reading? We've been talking a little too long. We should do more poems, too. Uh, what do you want to oh, read next? Yeah, uh, let me see. I have here maybe an example of one of my political poems. Uh, and also, you know, uh, I remember you published me because I got into I got into going to the gun range. And, and I remember you got you, you were interested in that a little bit. Um, I, I'm not doing it now, obviously, because it's like a corona you know, <laughs> infested area you know mm-hmm. i tried to go to an outdoor one and it was just uh it was actually a really interesting experience but it was too it was full of people but anyway this is called it's on page 50 and it's called dirty democrats but please don't misunderstand me <laughs> i i'm not i'm not crapping on democrats i'm a democrat so all right at first the gun range employee says my son's too young Though on the phone, they'd said 10 years old was just right. But then he says, it's Christmas, so go ahead. We ran a 22 rifle by the little rounds. My son, meticulous as he is, listens intently as the young man shows him how to load the rifle, how to hold it in his 10-year-old hands. My son never shows when he's enthralled, but I can tell he is because of his attention level. 
My son fires his first shots at a circled target. They're all near the center. He doesn't smile. He just hits the target, reloads, and hits it again. Then speaking loudly into my earmuffs, he says, This is fun. I step back to observe him. I recall the man in line before us talking to me about the dirty Democrats, about how they should be in jail. He says to me, you know, teachers don't even teach anymore. They indoctrinate. You know, Marxism, Leninism. I fail to tell him I'm a teacher. I let him be the person he is. I'm here for my son. I'm here to show him how to shoot a gun. Next, my son shoots a revolver, a heavy twenty-two. It looks too big in his hands, but this time he smiles and says, Wow, this one's louder. The revolver is silver. The gun guy told us it was very old. Once or twice, the chamber didn't release the casings. The bullets would expand because of heat. My son learned about this, too. At the range, lessons come fast. My son wants to know if the glittering specks at the back of the range are bullets. I tell him, I think so. The image makes me think of the dragon's treasure hoard in Beowulf. I feel pride now, and I fold my arms and watch my son add his own glittering to the jet black backstop of the range. And that was Dirty Democrats from uh, Alejandro's newest book, The Book of Un the Unclaimed Dead. Um, and that, that is interesting. I think you're, you're one of the few poets I've, I've seen, and I read so many poems, obviously, um, about talking about the, that gun culture sort of feeling, the, the, the sort of adrenaline. The other time I heard somebody talking about uh, this friend of mine who um, got an e-bike, and he said, yeah. um, when you buy an e-bike, um, like they, they just give, make, you, make you do a test drive, basically. And then when yeah. you pull out and you ride around and it's like no effort like you're a kid again, they, he, they pull back like with an ear-to-ear -ear grin and um, everybody <laughs> buys the e-bike. And that's like the trick for selling <laughs> e-bikes. And, um, yeah. and I, I've, I've heard um, that there's that feeling f shooting, like at the shooting range, that you have this sort of like rush of, um, I don't know if it's like endorphins or, or what it is, but, but this yeah. like happy feeling. Um, and, and very few poets have ever written about it that I've seen, except for you. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about how, because you weren't like a gun person. How did that happen that you got into shooting? Well, um, I think it's, it's you know, um, I've always been interested in words. Words are abstract. Uh, English is abstract. Uh, and at times it can be just heartbreaking, you know, uh, the rejections, um, the... Um, you know, maybe listeners can identify, you know, just thousands of rejections, you know, for every one you might get uh, in. So you, and then and then just the, the, the poetry genre itself is frustrating because, again, there's, you know, I don't have to tell you there's no money in it. And you don't know where all this is going. I mean, even if you publish a book, it, it there's no finality. And for I think for me, uh, when I went into the range it, there was two things that happened. One is that there was a sort of strange sort of like uh, you, you shoot and that's it. You know, mm -hmm. there's a there's a pleasure in that kind of finality of that. Um, you you feel like it's wrapped up. Uh, something is is wrapping up. Uh, you know, and and I know that sounds kind of macabre, but but it is. And then there's also the mechanical nature of guns, which is I've never been a mechanical guy. So uh, this is going to sound funny, but it's my version of tinkering in an engine. Hmm. You know how some guys go and they, they, they fix their cars and you see them with all their, you know, their greasy hands and they're rolling under the car and they just love to do that on the weekends. My version is tinkering with the gun, with the, the, the mechanics, mm -hmm. like pulling it apart. I actually like cleaning it. So it's a stupid reason. It's like it's not what people think. It's like I like to clean it. I mean, Jesus, that's dumb. You know, that's not what you think. You know, I like to clean it. I like the smell of it, like the um, the smell of when you shoot. You know, it smells like fireworks. Um, when I was in Argentina, there was a lot of fireworks for Christmas. We, we actually launched fireworks for Christmas. <laughs> and to me, that was one of the happiest times for me as a kid. And so that smell – is 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 Christmas in Argentina for me? It's not gunfire. Mm. So you're talking about different associations, you know, uh, um, 
So that's that's what it is for me. Um, I don't even know if I'll continue doing it. Honestly, I think it was just a, it may have been a phase mm-hmm. that I went through, uh, you know, and that I maybe had to get through or something. But uh, but it, I, I I'm just interested in stuff that people associate, and then you go and you you ex- you, you you experience it. This is part of being a journalist. You go and you experience it, and it's not what you think. Mm-hmm. You you might spend a week with I don't know ISIS guys, and come out and go oh my God they're not what I thought or something I don't know it's it's just different that kind of experience, of of being in the foreign, is interesting. So so what yeah. made you go for the first time to to arrange and shoot? What was the, that brought you there? Uh, yeah I think I just wanted to learn something new kind of like when you want to learn a martial art or something, uh, and I think it just I needed to get out of my own familiar surroundings uh to me being a poet you know and i i i I don't know if you've ever heard about this but i identify with being kind of an hsp which is a highly sensitive person uh you know you could there's there's books on it i identify with that um being a highly sensitive young man uh growing up uh, my mom didn't know that i was that way um and then on top of that being a being a teacher uh all of that, the the gun, you know, going and shooting a gun is the most opposite thing you can do. You know, you want to shock yourself. It's kind of like, it's kind of like, you know, jumping out of an airplane. You know, it it it's, it really does feel that way. Um, and so I think I think that's what I wanted to do. Kind of a shock to the system. You know what? And uh, you know, and I think part of it is just the stupid young boy thing that you want to be the Lone Ranger. You know, you. When I was little, I watched Bonanza. You know, I, I'm a Western. Uh, the spaghetti western fan you know I, you know all those all those movies are awesome to me yeah th- there's something in it too that i feel like is just so archetypal like it's like built into evolutionary biology or something and, and, you, and you close this poem out with the oh. um the the dragon the treasure's hoard you know and there's that whole yeah. mythology that um you know going down to slay the dragon is the original myths and things like that and hitting the target yeah. and there's just there's such a innate I don't know. There's something weirdly human about, you know, we originally had those like catapulty slings, but we've had that for so long and to have an extension of that. It's one of those things you talk a lot about in your poems, the sort of the the difficulties with the modern world. And, um, and it feels like this is like, like it's a way to, to look back at that history that we're sort of stepped outside of in the modern world. Yeah. It's, it's also, uh, Robert Bly, you know, wrote a lot about male, um, mythology and you know growing up uh having that kind of uh, you know passing the threshold into manhood you know joseph campbell robert bly is is a, those kinds of people are very important to me um you know i read uh, uh books by him uh, about about male um uh, sort of development and so to me that's that's a big part of my poem to my poems too mm-hmm. is how do we become men in this in this culture because it's uh, as you can tell we're confused you know men are confused uh you know and uh, all men you know it's it's not just gender i mean it's any gender uh, you know we're all confused a bit and it's like what you know how do we find that and now that i have a boy it's like you know that they're, they're, that that's what i think the poem is really about mm-hmm. is is what, you know, how do we raise young boys? And and I'm not even saying I did the right thing. The poem is almost an ex- like saying, "Ooh, shit, what did I do?" You know, because I remember thinking this is not good. You know, maybe I should be taking them golfing. You know, mm-hmm. uh, and so part of the thing was part of the poem was a, a sort of like a confession. You know, this is how lost we are. That this is where I'm looking for it. You yeah. know, it, it, yeah. You know, this is how much we miss maleness. Uh, and and how much we miss our fathers, like you know, where are our fathers? Where are our uh, nurturers? You know that 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 we're we're kind of this lost. So I'm not saying in any way that the poem is actually a good thing. Yeah, yeah. The other thing that's very similar, I think, is the jujitsu, sort of the rise of of mixed martial arts, and, um, and yeah. you know, like my son, uh, we take him yeah. to, or until until the pandemic, we took him to jujitsu. And, um, yeah. and, and there's really, it's, it's a, it's a whole culture now all of a sudden that like, um, you know, like sort of nerdy middle-aged men are trying to go back and do jujitsu because they feel like they've missed out on something during their midlife crisis or whatever. Um, but yeah. you, we talked about, you, you brought up this highly sensitive people thing and some people were asking yeah. about that. Um, 
Do you want to yeah. explain a little bit about about what that means to you and um, and how that relates yeah. to poetry? Because I think it, it probably does, right? Oh, big time. Uh, you can Google uh, people who are interested. You can Google, and I don't mind being her poster child. That's fine. Uh, Elaine Aaron, you know, A R O N. She's uh, she's sort of the proponent. Um, there's a lot of therapists and and, and psychologists uh, who are who are sort of understanding this a little bit. Basically, it's not being sensitive. Like, you know, in the way we think of it, it's um, the way I like to explain it to people is we would make really good spies hmm. uh, because uh, and actually, you know, people who are HSPs are recruited for that kind of thing, because what they do is they sense a lot. So there's a lot of sensory stuff. And so you can't think of it as being, oh, that's just a sensitive person, you know, or uh, the, yeah, the feelings are deeper. So the, 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 the you know, love, hate. Um, any kind of uh, real, uh, basically the the um, the nervous system is what you know they call it finely tuned, right? So it's a finely tuned nervous system, and so you'll know if a child has it. There's books for HSP children uh, because a child sometimes if they're if they're really emotional, uh, they could be a sign. Um, but I'm a, I'm a believer in it. Some people are skeptical uh, naturally. Does it- in point. Does yeah. it have to do with, with introversion? Like I'm thinking about how, um, you know, like being in a yep. group of people is exhausting and it's because, it um, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm introverted. So like one-on-one I'm like mind reading constantly and like picking up and everything. But when it's like multiple people, it's like, I can't like, it's like a mental overload. It's like the system crashes yeah. or something. Is that, is yeah. that tied into it or, or not? Yes. Uh, introversion is not HSP, though, mm-hmm. because you can be HSP and be an extrovert. Hmm. Um, it, it's basically about how deep you feel feelings. And, and the problem is that with HSPs, they feel them so, diff- so deeply that it can be uh, very, very painful. Uh, so you have to sort of manage it. Um, but it's not a, it's not a, um, it's not a, uh, a problem. It's not a, an actual maladaptive personality or something you know it's not that it's just a different type of person according to this uh psychologist uh it's like uh oh i'm gonna forget but i think it's like 20 percent of the population so it's everywhere uh but yet 20 percent you know so you're not going to you're going to notice the people who are non-hsp more than the people who are hsp you know um but once you learn about it you're like oh my god you could start to see people uh and maybe even people in your own family um, uh, so, so it, it's very interesting in poetry. I think it, it, it helped me become a poet, um, obviously because of the senses. So your senses are finely tuned as well. Um, it's like I said, it, it, you know, it kind of sounds a little bit like, Oh my God, highfalutin, but it, it's not that because it can have such problems. I mean, you, you literally, you know, uh, it sounds, you know, if a dog barks too much, your 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 mood changes. You know, uh, a siren goes by, and and you have to wait to talk to someone else. You know, so it can be problematic too. But for poetry, it's very helpful. Um, but I but I don't think poets need to be HSP. I mean, some of my favorite poets, my my influences were not HSP clearly. Uh, you know, and they were the best. You know, you know, when you talk about Robert Frost. You know, someone like that. I love Robert Frost, but boy, was he not HSP, you know, and uh, and and uh, people like that. But then others, you know, I'm thinking of others in history like, you know, Garcia Lorca. You know, you look at Garcia Lorca and, and there was some things he said. Now I think back and I go, oh, my God, you know, uh, they didn't know, you know, that he was that uh, and or he had a, a nervous system like that. Um, uh, and you could start to see other artists uh, that way as well. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting stuff. Um, but let me remind everybody again, if you have any questions for Alejandro, um, just ask him in the comments and I will pass them along. But let's keep doing some poems. Um, Alex, let's do uh, like two now. Sure. Uh, this is called Numbers, and it is about, uh, um, I think, you know, going through divorce. Uh, I have a, some divorce poems in here, uh, which is, again, kind of, connected to I mean think about the senses and think about what that does if you're going through something like that um, so it's it's an, it's it's an intense experience it's it's a sort of existential thing for I don't know maybe for all poets I mean you, you know Sharon Olds wrote a lot about that relationships and things like that 
But this is called Numbers, and it's on page 56. Uh, there's nothing to be mad at anymore. The cycle is broken, and now I'm pedaling a rusty bicycle with a severed chain. The buccaneer ship has emptied its loot off of, off of a crystalline cove, and I haven't lost hope as much as understood its particulars. Marriage doesn't make for good poetry, no matter how well it's written. And so I refuse to say what occurred. What occurred is what never occurs in the life of those who've made a life outside of wedlock and children. This is what I've wanted to ask the unmarried and childless. How did you mature before the gate closed? How could you play the lottery then forget the ticket on the liquor store counter? But those folks don't play the lottery because they've figured out the odds. And the odds told them it's impossible, much like marriage, ever to pick a winner. That was Numbers from uh, the Book of the Dead. Let's hear another one, too. Um, this last one is one I haven't, uh, is coming out, but I really felt that I wanted to read it because it means a lot, uh, especially during this time of pandemic and, and, um, and sort of technology. We're all technology people. So this is called uh, Babel, like the Tower of Babel. And so the tower visits me when I'm alone, feeling slightly fractured, as the tower is also fractured. Planes drone by, and the tower leans to let them pass. It sways to the left in Hebrew, to the right in French. It says to me, you. I knew you when you were down in a trench. I say it must be confusing, I say it must be confusing me with someone else. The tower says, that could be true. I'm often confused. The tower plods beside me. Its sides scrape my cheeks. I glance inside the windows and see mouths become other mouths. Why have you visited me lately? I asked the tower. It replies, I watched over when you I watched over over you when you were a child, weeping in the desert. That was no desert, I corrected it. It was a playground. Don't you recall I could not yet speak English? The tower suddenly shrinks down to the size of an upright brick. You, I remember when she dismissed you for being afraid. I rub my eyes. You mean when my wife left me after two decades. But time means nothing to the tower. I watched as you meditated beside the river of wild horses. I say, you're always so confused. I was sitting near a bustling highway. The tower says, you were in the trenches. You navigated my passageways. You were death, and death was you. You carried all languages within you. You do so again. I arose so you'd walk up my ramps, interpret my scrolls and palimpsests, climb toward the sky riddled with stars. I heard all this, but spoke nothing back to the tower. And where was that going to be published again? Uh, this is going to be in plume poetry. Oh, that's right, yeah. Alongside uh, uh, one a poem by David Kirby, who's a great poet, big fan. Yeah, yeah, we are too. We published him a bunch of times. Um, um, the the thing that I I always like about your poetry, which is why the news poems work so well that you do, is that you always seem to be um, like wrestling with something. You know, you're trying to find an answer to something that you're struggling with in every poem, it seems, which is what makes it real poetry, in, in my opinion, the way I conceptualize poems working. Um, was there a first time, was there a first poem for you where you, like, learned something about yourself and then, you know, that, that you didn't know? Like, was there a, for me, there was a poem that, that clicked and I was like, whoa, I didn't know I knew that, you know, like, that's what that is. <laughs> did, did you have that experience, too? Is that part of the thing that drew you to poetry? Yeah, I think I think maybe the one I was thinking of reading today was the the driving range, which I think was the first poem I published in Rattle. Yeah, or yeah. one of the first. And um, that one, uh, you know, I was wondering what it all meant to be a dad, and I, you know, again, I I think it was another one about taking my kids somewhere, you know, and um, and I remember finishing that poem and and feeling like, yeah, now I get 
what's happening, you know, uh, with, with being a dad and, and why it's hard and, you know, why it's related to what my, my own father, you know, how, how that sort of, you know, three people triangle works, you know, the, 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 the son, the father and the, and the and grandfather, you know, mm-hmm. uh, you know, how that, how that relationship, uh, begins to matter, begins to talk to itself, um, uh, and so that was that was something that that was like that, yeah. Uh, but I think those poems happened later. Um, I think for a long time I, I, I was just trying to write poems uh, instead of reflecting what was going on with me. And I think that maybe what happens to a maturing poet is they stop writing poetry and they start writing what's going on, you know. And and they're almost they're almost they learn the language. So now it's just about talking in the language as opposed to learning the language. Mm -hmm. And for a long time, you learn the language. You learn it by, I'm going to write about the ocean. You know, I'm going to write about my girlfriend. You know, it's like, (laughs) uh, you know, and then that changed. Yeah, I've always felt, you know, poetry is a mantra. And in the Sanskrit, the the word mantra, the tra is tool. It's a mind tool is what the the mantra is. And I think, I feel like real poetry, like going back to that, um, what you were talking about with the slam at your school. I think the problem yeah. is that the, you know, those poems weren't using poetry as a tool of understanding. It wasn't a mind tool. It was um, right. expression, which is different than, uh, than using yeah. it as a tool. Um, yeah. Do you, do you want to read the, the driving range poem? I have it here. It's in the other sure. book, but, but that'd be a good one to do. Yeah, I can do that. Um, I have it here. I think it was on page 17. Yeah. And this was from the book that I, My Earthbound Eye, and, it, and this is The Driving Range. Now minutes scale the walls of the house like rodents. The squeaks grow louder, and the lights go out like the faces of disappointed women. I heard it all before. Nothing will be the same. Your life is going to change. And I'm supposed to do all this without complaining? Like the time my father took me along to work in his truck, me, na- me nagging for having been roused from a summer slumber. We pulled into an alley, heaved out the trash from the building site. I didn't know it was illegal until he hit the accelerator and I felt the rush of escape, the thrill of leaving behind all that shit. Today he offers me praise and code, and when he gives advice, he mutters underneath his breath, as though it were against the law. The neighborhood heaves with a thousand types of desire, and when the doorbell rings, it's grandma with a pair of knit booties for our newborn son who eats his fingers and is really just a mouth. When the screaming stops, I swallow huge gulps of love and then go to the driving range where other men swing metal clubs at balls that will never do what they wish. Yeah, that's a great ending to that poem. And I I think this, I read this poem um, before uh, we had kids. I think you had kids a little bit before us and submitted this. And then that whole, uh, that line about the, um, (laughs) who eats his fingers and is really just a mouth. Every time... Like, you know, holding the baby. I would be thinking about yeah. that line from that poem because it is so true. Yeah, um, yeah they're cute, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah, that is such a great ending to that poem. And, and you can see where the spontaneous sort of understanding came from in those last few lines. Um, does does yeah. your, your father, I can't remember, is your father still in Argentina or did he move here too? No, he's here. My parents are here. Mm-hmm. Uh, they live in Marina del Rey. They're real close by of me, and um, I see them every weekend. Um, you know, it's we we kind of broke that pandemic thing, and finally, and so we do see each other. We're part of the bubble, I guess, or our own bubble. Mm-hmm. Uh, hey, what does he yeah. What does he think about um of being a poet? The um, you know, because you write about father son relationships so much. I think he, yeah. if I remember right, he owned a rent managed a mine in Argentina. Is that right? And then he became yeah. a like a sort of repairman, handyman, mm-hmm. and when he moved to the United yeah. States, yeah, not a mine, but a place where they grind up rocks, oh, okay. where they use rocks for different mineral for different stuff. You know, like, um, uh, you know, just different works. Um, yeah, and then he came here and became yeah, he kind of just started his own construction company, and. Uh, so you know, kind of the American dream, you know. Uh, they did well, um, you know, not super. I mean, we're middle class, but he, um, yeah, I, I, it's hard to say because he comes from a very working class background. 
um, where you know poetry is not something that he understands as being anything you know it it, it, it to him it's actually to, it's funny to him he told me once it just sounds something that the rich do <laughs> yeah well, like well that's a, that's like a, a problem you know that that poetry is yeah. sort of a thing that's like upper middle class for the most part yeah um yeah and th- how do we how do we make it so that that regular people want to experience this i know we talked about national poetry month as a marketing and how that doesn't work but how do you get people like have you um try to get your parents into poetry or have you gotten like when you've had success getting students into poetry is there a way that you did it like did you say like i know this kid's gonna like this poem and then that's gonna light the fire is that is there anything that works like that or not um i think just exposing them you know kind of like the way i was exposed to it um and um i think when you're teaching and you read a poem and uh, you have to be careful because it's actually kind of dangerous. Uh, teaching, a lot of people won't tell you this, but maybe this is HSP, right? A lot of people won't tell you this, but if you bring a poem that means a lot to you, to a group of teenagers, hold on. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you, may, you may be traumatized <laughs> for a long time. <laughs> they are going to rip, you know, they're either going to rip it apart it's a big risk. Mm-hmm. They're either going to be like, what the hell are you talking about? Like, I, di- I think, I think I once brought in, you know, like, I don't know, Frank O'Hara having a Coke with you, you know? Or, you know, I was thinking about it recently, Robert Creeley's, you know, I Know a Man uh, poem, which is one of my, I just realized maybe yesterday how much I love that poem. Um, and it's very short. I recommend anybody reads it. I Know a Man um, but I would I would have some crazy hair and, and then just bring it in and be like this is a poem right and and uh, and they'd be like what you know they 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 would either have that what reaction you know they would do the stupid creative writing thing I had them do which was uh, you know really kind of like using the poem as a prompt you know uh, and they would do it uh, other times you would bring in something I would bring in something like that and I could sense the silence you know, like in a good poetry reading where something's being communicated. Um, And I think that's, you know, I hate to sound like that's the only hope, but I think if you can get to that point where there's that silence and maybe some kid, you know, nods a little bit, uh, I think that's it. Uh, You know, to look for anything else is inauthentic. Um, uh, Maybe you'll get that one kid, you know, who goes to college and then writes you back and says, you know, I you know I'm into poetry. Uh, that hasn't happened to me yet. Um, maybe it will. I, I you know I know that I've 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 been thanked for for having taught them how to write, uh, which always is is what I live for. You know, much better than like liked you as a teacher. You know, but but if they say you know you you helped me you helped me win college uh, with my writing. Uh, that, that 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 that's the best I can hope for. But I think I think poetry is mystery. Uh, it is a mystery, and when you try to plug it. When you try to drag it out of that mystery, it's like dragging a child out of like a, a playground when he wants to, he, he doesn't want to go home, you know. And you're trying to take it home, and and poetry's gonna kick and scream and get so mad at you um, if you if you try to do that. And I think that yeah, just let just let poetry play in the playground, man. You know, um, it, 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 it it's a mystery. It's a mystery. It's a lot like art. I'm a big fan of art. Um. You know, so when you go to an art gallery, uh, you know, that's kind of mysterious, too, in terms of how the art speaks to you. You know, they always have that you that that, that famous guy, you know, who's always like trying to be all, uh, you know, the cliche person trying to talk about the art and then ruins it. Um, I kind of think that poetry works that way, at least the poetry I like, which is a certain vein. You know, there are different veins. You know, there's the academic vein. There's the the slam poetry vein, I think expression is part of it. But then there's this vein that's, you know, I can name names, like in the mafia, you know, I could, I could, I could tell all them, you know, uh, but, but there's a certain vein of poetry that I'm trying to write. And I'm, I'm hoping it's, you know, everybody says, oh, it's dead, you know, or something like that. And I, I, I before somebody tells me that poetry is dead, they better identify the right vein. Because if, if you tell me, okay, 
rhyming poetry, okay, I, okay, I understand, whatever. But if you you have to be specific. You have to tell me, you know, I read Thomas Transtromer, and I think poetry's dead. You know, you have to say that, and and because you can't say that, you know, uh, I I doubt it. You know. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, people on the chat are talking about my comment about how poetry is upper middle class, <laughs> which I don't mean all yeah. poetry is that way, of course. But the thing is, if you, the people who are who are really serious about it and and have successfully published a lot of books, they can go to conferences, they can get an MFA, they can yeah. go to the AWP conference, they can go to retreats. There's there's this whole industry of um, retreats yeah. and um, you know like writers workshops and things like that, which is what we try to. It rattled that we try to, um, yeah, you know, g give outlets. That's why we do like the critique of the week, so people can have that experience if they don't have access to an MFA program and things like that. Yeah. Um, but but it is true. It's it, the, it's it's easy to be rewarded if you have resources to to devote time and money into doing poetry. It's not it's not as free as people imagine it would be. It's not as free as a library card. No. Um, no, I, I did. I did financially like irresponsible things to get my book. I mean, I, I put, I put, my, I, I, I entered contests and put it all on my credit card. I mean, I did, I did bad, you know, bad things <laughs> financially in order to be able to to do it. You know, I mean, yeah, and the, and some the of the entry fees, the contest fees, all that stuff. Yeah, entry fees like going to, I, you know, I went to to Portland to the uh, AWP, uh, and and that cost a lot of money. Um, uh, but I, but it, but, but you know, with me again, it's it's funny. You know, we're we're doing the circle thing, but like it, you know, HSP. You know, what mattered is I, I had a friend who was going up there, and I wanted to see him. So, um, I think, you know, it it is it is it does have that side of it. Um, but I but I still think you don't need a lot. You know, you certainly you certainly can do it better. You know, better than being a painter. I think, for example, being a painter is harder. Yeah, yeah, for uh, sure. I mean, you know, canvases breaking, are expensive. <laughs> yeah, no, and, and even just getting noticed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I, there, I don't think there's a rattle for modern painters, you know. Uh, you, you, either, you either make it or you don't. Uh, so I think that poetry has got a little, little bit of that, at least a little bit of uh, positivity in that sense. Mm -hmm. um, I wish, sometimes I wish I was more a fiction writer, so I can make some money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But that's about it. Yeah. Um, there's a, a, an um, ab absurdity MHN asks an interesting question. I know you, we haven't really got into like schools of poetry. You mentioned your vein of poetry. And I'm just yeah. going to read this and see if you can make sense of it. It's hard for me to think and, and talk at the same time. <laughs> but um, why the that's American what... poetry is so expressive and expressionist? I think it should say, why is American poetry so expressive, expressive and expressionist? and has lost yeah. its cubistic perspectives. The Whitman okay. and Beat kinds of poetics, I mean, through boring narrative techniques. Or techniques. What do you, um, what do you think of that? Well, I mean, uh, did he say beat? Beat, yeah, right? Beats. The, beats were, the beats were pretty narrative. You know, if you look, if you read Allen Ginsberg, I mean, it's pretty narrative. Uh, even when he gets, uh, you know, I love that poem where he mentions Moloch, you know, Moloch, mm -hmm. you know, the... Yeah, the lover I, of that's blood and oil. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I love <laughs> oh, yeah. And and uh, um, that's just that's very narrative. But it, it's got magic, magical realism in it, which is I I love magical. I mean, that's maybe that's the vein I'm describing mm -hmm. is a kind of American magical realism. Um, but uh, but it's very narrative. Uh, uh the beats. Um, I think that getting away from narrative is is good too. Like I have the New York School very runs in my veins you know uh, like i said john ashbury before uh frank o'hara uh i think it's i i'm teaching my kids right now to actually do it which is you know get off the subject which is uh richard hugo's famous you know dictum so so how would you describe um, that that vein of poetry that you like like who are some of your favorite poets that are most informative and like how just would you characterize what they do versus what other people do well, some of them are not just American, you know. Like I did mention, Tranströmer and um, um, uh, well, uh, Rilke, uh, um, you know, people like that. Um, I think Robert Bly, um, uh, like I said, John Ashbery. These are people who their poems. Uh, well, you know, Robert Bly wrote that famous anthology, Leaping Poetry. 
And to me, that's that's the vein that I fell in love with. Um, I didn't even know that because it started with Elliot. Uh, I, I think Elliot kind of uh, defrauded me because I, I never read a poem like Proof Rock again by him. You know, I mean, somebody's going to disagree with me. But I, I read Proof Rock and he doesn't have other poems like that. And and so for the rest of my life, I looked for that which he should have just kept yeah. doing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Elliot was kind of a one-hit wonder. I think that's the quote. For yeah, he should have, should have quit that bank earlier, man. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I, I think that I think I looked for that my whole life uh, and found it in uh, God. I'm thinking about that. Oh, I'm forgetting the names now, but the northern. Um, he's from Washington, I think. Um, uh, he he was known for writing lots of poems uh, every day, um, but then I also got into poets. Uh, one of the ways I got into poets, I don't know if anybody's interested in using this method, but I I tended to relate to poets that wrote like me. So I didn't like academic poets. You know, I I stayed away from from that kind of um, university type uh, poet that you know where you needed. Um, uh, a lot of I felt like you needed a lot of study uh, to get what they were saying. You know, I mean, I, I, I know that sounds cliche, but that's how I felt. Um, there was a lot of illusion, you know, I, I, and I would read those kinds of poems and they, they just wouldn't speak to me. And if they didn't speak to me, I, I just finally I was able to put them aside and say, this isn't me. You know, I can I can I can appreciate the, the success those people have because they have a lot of success uh, in my point of view. Um, but but I but that's not me. And so for me, it's much more of um, uh, you know I, I don't know the kind of Wendell Berry type of feeling uh, you know that you you bring to to poems um, a spiritual component, magical realism, uh, talking about life and its essentials. You know uh, your um, uh, big moments in, in life: having a child, getting married, getting divorced, uh, death. Um, I love Sharon Olds for that reason too. I think when you start to say, I think it's very American to say I'm a narrative poet or I'm a, I'm an abstract poet or something like that. So I think I stay away from those things. I think that, um, I do try to stay aware of the the Latin American poets too. You know, there's like, um, Cernuda, uh, if you, if you know that name, um, uh, the, the the Spanish poets of the generation, the, they call them the generation of 1920, uh, which includes Becker. Um, you know, he doesn't have a Spanish name, but he's he's a Spanish poet. Um, those were big influences in me, too, because they were so surreal. And so surrealism is important, too. Um, but you can't say, I'm, I'm going to write narrative, and that's it. You know, uh, wh- why not do both? My parent, my 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 poems go from narrative to magical realism, you know, like that. A, you know, in a in a snap, uh, and then I I don't go, oh my god, I can't do that. You know, um, so I, I think uh, mixing genres is or mixing the type is is good for you too. Yeah, I, I think that um, the whole idea of these schools of poetry has so much to do with um, poetry yeah. being in in the university system. It's yeah. sort of like because because. It, it, it's it's viewing poetry through the lens of teaching, which is it makes yes. it easy to construct sort of different schools so you can have like lessons on this, you know, this group of poets. And so the weird thing that yeah. happens, it's sort of like you almost can't become a famous poet nowadays unless yeah. you have a manifesto, that you're part of a group with a manifesto. And so I've always joked that yeah, like yeah. like, you know, people need to make a manifesto or else they're not gonna count. And um and, yeah. and I, so I feel like I don't know, something's a little bit lost in there, but it's also you know, a way to, to, you know, sort of libraryize the, the world too in your, in your mind of who fits yeah. with who and stuff like that. Um, this is why, despite, despite him being a curmudgeon and all that, I like Bukowski because Bukowski showed me that, you know, uh, you can do your own thing. Uh, and he was from LA. Uh, yeah, he got lucky. I mean, it, I mean, it was just all luck, the story behind Bukowski, but at least it showed that. Well, that what kind is the of, story behind Bukowski? Uh, I don't, I don't know how it's luck. Oh, well, it's luck because he had a, a publisher who one day just dropped by his house, you know, after reading some articles by him in a newspaper. Uh, maybe that's why I relate to him, because he was published in newspapers. Um, 
And he said, look, right, I love your poems, you know, and, and apparently he had published some poems in the LA Weekly, too, um, uh, or, or some other kind of, you know, kind of a throwaway, the LA Weekly is not throwaway, but like some kind of Hollywood rag. And he said, um, I want you to write a novel. And the, the story is, I don't believe, I don't know if I, you can believe Bukowski, but he said he wrote a novel in, in, in a month and that was the post. Oh, really? See, I, I didn't know that. And he said, if you could write me a novel, you know, I'll give you a hundred bucks a month. Oh, not a hundred bucks a month. I'll give you the money you need to survive a, oh, a wow. month. Uh, so you can stop working as a mailman. And, and Bukowski, and they asked him, how did you write a novel in a month? And Bukowski's only response was fear. <laughs> That's a good story. I'm not. I'm not a huge uh, scholar of Bukowski. That's interesting. Um, yeah. So, do you yeah. want? We're kind of out of time. Do you want to close out with one last poem? Oh sure. Uh, let's see. I'm sorry. Maybe. Well, this one kind of sums up. Uh, what we were talking about a little bit. So this is called Stir, and it's on page 21. Of my Earthbound Eye, or the new book? Yeah, uh, The Book of the Young okay. Dead. So this is from my new uh, My first critic was my father. His, wor his word for me was vago, Argentine slang for vagabond or lazy bones. From then on, I believe the world thought of me as lazy. Only now I realize he didn't mean lazy. He meant self-centered as in taking care of my needs first. Something he was not allowed to do as the only male child among three older sisters. No living father and a domineering mother. Of course I speak of father when he was my age, not the goodly king he is today. My son draped around his shoulders, his earnest kiss. I intimidate my father today. In a foul mood at my son's party, I warned him I was feeling angry. He put his hand on my shoulder and spoke to me gently and lovingly for the rest of the day. I think he knows I've been inside too many intimidating small rooms, shaken too many intimidating hands, lusted after too many intimidating women. I turned 38 in August, and at this point, nothing intimidating is worth it. No man, woman, or institution. I wish to be in the perpetual company of mother's red sauce and polenta. I want my poetry to emanate from the deepest chambers of the soul, not from the tiny rooms furnished like Versailles. Not like the editor who wrote, once wrote back, sorry, but your poems never get off the subject. I've never left my subject for longer than an hour. It lies perpetually there, like a dead bird I cannot bear remove hoping it will stir again. Oh, that's a great way to end it. That was Stir from uh, Alejandro's newest book, The Book of Unclaimed Dead, which is available, of course, from Main Street Rag Press. You can find it there. Um, I don't see the website, but you can find it at Alejandro's website, too, which would be... Um, uh, where would it be? It would be... Um, Escudepoetry.com. There you go. E-S-C-U-D-E poetry.com. Thanks so much for joining us, Alejandro. Mm -hmm. It's always a pleasure talking to you. A lot of fun. Thanks so much for joining us on the Rattlecast. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, good, good to, to see you too. too. Bye. Take care. Yeah, so that was Alejandro Escudé uh, once again with his newest book, um, The Book of the Unclaimed Dead. And uh, you can find him at Escudé Poetry. <laughs> Escudé Poetry.com. Now let's move on to the open mic portion of the show. Um, and I should put these numbers up before we do. Um, the number is 818-850-7727. A bunch of people have called already, so you know the drill. But um, you can call that, let it ring a few times, and I will call you back when the time is right if you have a prop poem for today. The other option, which is slightly preferred, but only slightly, is uh, to use Skype and send a chat message to me at Rattle Poetry. And once again, I will call when the time is right. A uh, reminder that I am calling from the future. There's about a 30-second delay. Um, so, so it'll surprise you, so be prepared. And when I do call, uh, make sure you turn off your stream wherever you're watching it so that um, you don't get confused by the, by the overlap. Um, now, the, the prompt for today was, look out your window, write a poem about what you see. That was this week's prompt. Um, always, these are by Megan. 
uh, look out your window, write a poem about what you see. And uh, my poem for the day, which is the window I'm looking out right now, this is called Smoke Report from the Office Window. And this is all true. These are real birds that are out there every day. It's kind of like being at the, some kind of magical bird zoo or something, this office. It's a really nice place, I have to say. But this is Smoke Report from the Office Window. The sun's a red plum in an ash can sky, but northern flickers only fight for the fruit that's still on the tree. The orange-crowned warbler can't repel a rival male in the car's side mirror. Anna's hummingbird drinks from a half-eaten cherry that the ground squirrels dropped. Last week, a goldfinch crashed into the plate glass. A snow angel lives in its feathered dust. Natal's woodpecker bangs his beak on the steel drum of a distribution box high overhead. We're sure he likes the sound. His mate must hear it for miles. So that is my smoke report from the office window. Um, there's Megan's poem from a different window. <laughs> this is the oak tree, which is the, the back window of our bedroom. The oak tree. When I was pregnant and so sick that life distilled to the minutes between vomits, I used to steady myself with the sight of it, the way a branch would bow a little before it dropped an acorn, like an old woman feeding pigeons at the park. After I had my son, I would watch my four-year-old daughter play in its shade, the baby strapped to my chest like a second heart, hormonal storms quietly brewing in the edges of my vision. I would place those tiny palms against the bark of the trunk and say rough, wanting him to understand the world, what it feels like, what it means. Now, quarantined, my children make it a playground, and I read beneath it, and we all float in and out of the moment, fluttering away like leaves, then sinking back into the earth, three tangled roots. In the windstorm weeks ago, the birdhouse, already here when we moved in years ago, crashed to the ground, and I did nothing, though I pass by it every day as it lies on its side in the dirt, and every time I think this used to be somebody's home, and hope maybe, somehow, it still is. Oh, that's an excellent poem. I hadn't read that yet. That was The Oak Tree by Megan Green. Um, and now let's turn to your poems. Um, let's see, who do we have first? And, and I should say, I think I forgot to say, um, when you call in, you can also email your poem so we can see it to um, rattle, or open mic at rattle.com. So send your poem in an email to open mic at rattle.com. And um, there we go. I'm going to fix that. And, um, and then call in and we'll read it. So let's see who is up first. Um, first one to ask on was Angela Gartner. Let's call up Angela. <laughs> no problem. Let me, let me play in. <laughs> yeah yeah you got in first this time um wow. so let me find your poem for a second what was it it was um was it oh here it is spring free spring free yep and um well i don't have to ask anybody what it's about because it's all about what's outside your window so. <laughs> yeah but what's funny is um during the pandemic in april when i really started to kind of write poetry again for some inspiration I looked out my window and then wrote. So this is kind of like an older poem um, when it during the pandemic when I, I'm like, oh, I'll just look out my window and start writing. So it's kind of funny this prompt came up. So I revised it a little, um, but not too much. But this is during springtime of um, April when spring started happening. So okay, cool. Well, let's hear it. Spring free. Spring free. Birds whistling at each other on a wire, cleaning their feathers. Dogs playing in the backyard, filling their paws with mud. Small green buds on trees begin to produce leaves. But me, I'm sitting inside. Squirrels run by to play, games of dodge and chase. The click of raindrops falling on my house's blue awning. Moms with strollers walking, people at the bus stop talking. But me, I'm sitting inside. 
Delivery men drop squished packages on my front porch. Cars with wet tire treads whoosh past. I wonder their plans of escape. The outside, in spring, is free. It doesn't care about any disease. But me, I am sitting inside. Excellent. Thanks for sharing that. I know that feeling. Spring free. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, we live in a tiny town. And so every time a car goes by at night, which is like four times maybe all night, I, always, I think like, where were they going? <laughs> Well, yeah, and I live on a busy road, and there is actually a bus stop right on our side lawn, right out the out, outside. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of this window right here, you know, it has like all these different things. And you know, we live in like a like a real suburban, like city kind of neighborhood. So there's a lot of things to see to look outside, but it's uh, but I I, I did spring free eventually, but I'm still more inside than yeah, ever. Yeah. So. <laughs> well, thanks for calling right. and sharing that, Angela. Always a pleasure. Oh, it's a pleasure to you. Yep. Thanks. Have a great you night. Too. Okay, let's do. Um, who was next? Um, I think Kathy Gibbons was next. Oh, Vicky. No, Vicky Miko was next. Then we'll do Kathy Gibbons. Sorry, I didn't scroll down far enough. And, and Vicky's sent some poems and hasn't been able to be on yet, so I'm glad she can do it today. Hey, Vicky, how you doing? Hi. Good. That was, that uh, interview with Alejandro was just excellent. Yeah, he's he's and, fun uh, to talk to. Yeah, we have a good time. Uh, I know. <laughs> um, so what poem did you want to share? Or, or what do you have? So, um, well, it's um, it's self-explanatory, but I, I wanted to just mention that um, there's a subtle reference to my I have a problem with caged animals and birds, so my uh, sensitivity has come out a little bit in this poem. Interesting. It's called uh, The Human Marquee According to Crow. Nothing is unreal as long as you can imagine a crow. Uh, Munya Khan. The human marquee, according to Crow, now playing on balconies above the alleyway in the mini amphitheater, the card players, the pot gardener, the cat sitter, the hammock lawler, the grizzly grillers, and the stationary biker lost in her Mobius trance. Are they watching us, watching them? On the fourth floor penthouse, the finale of the half-naked party boys with their half dozen surfboards propped towards the sun gods. Thank God they're gone, evicted from their playful sanctuary. On the bottom catty corner terrace lives the sequestered macaw. I whistle to it, it whistles back. Unlike those free flyers that rally daily in squawking groves, funneling in between the high-rise corridors on a mission to somewhere, but not before landing to rest on the firebox chimneys, rain gutters, and various peaks where each roof tile seems a front row seat in their prized loge. These are the convivial corvus who perch to watch the curious goings on of humanity. <clears throat> Excuse me. Do they mock us or applaud us? We who live in these captive balconies, partly hidden behind the floss silks, jacarandas, and massive fan palms, the fan nothing but mulchy debris collecting on the sloping rooftops. I watch them pluck and fight over something from the the- oh, I think the call dropped. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll finish reading it for. Her. I watch them pluck and fight over something from the bunching chaff. Are they watching us, watching them? Are they fodder for our amusement, or vice versa? What must they think of us? Spectacles, of wanderers, thing carriers, leaf blowers, hedge cutters, we, the haughty, wingless, upright with strange rituals, entertained by caged birds. A preening crow for a moment, headless. It's an excellent poem. I like that a lot. I love that little um, haiku at the end, too. 
um, great descriptions of birds. That was Vicky Miko uh, reading her poem, The Human Marquis According to Crow. Very good. Thanks so much, Vicky. Sorry the call dropped. Um, but we got the rest of the poem in, so that's okay. Um, let's go to... Now let's do Kathy Gibbons. Let's see. There. Hey, Kathy, how are you doing tonight? I'm doing well, Tim. Thank you very much. Um, once again, it's a little quiet, and I've turned it up all the way. Could you, like, get a little closer to the phone? Is that possible? Oh. Okay, let me try. I thought I turned everything up tonight. <laughs> Is that any better or not? That's a little better, yeah, yeah. Okay, um, I'll try to talk louder. <laughs> okay, so your poem is Gazing Out Within, and ours poetic. Is there anything you want to say about it, or do you just want to dive right in? Oh, uh, no, I'll just dive right in. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, Gazing Out Within, and ours poetica. Be here in this fragile glassine envelope. Inhabit every moat that floats each spider lacy dangling on your window, the cracks creating crevices on every wall that binds you, permitting your escape to catch the faint vanilla fragrance of a baby's head, the Cheeto scent of golden dog who rushes through the air, fur flown back, and to taste the earthen jug of garden soils, tough dandelions and crabgrass. Mushrooms dank and staked against magnolia tree, as if artillery. To lift your head at clang of sirens, smoke unseen through a window screen, and at the silent music of the moth, its wings pure evanescence, opening to welcome you, alighting where the soft glow draws it in, composing self in still life, frozen and awaiting your discernment craving your attention to keep it breathing and alive as each moment comes and stays before it goes. And so that it never does, be addicted to the words. You write it down and up again. You break the glass, release the flying thing. Excellent. Thanks so much for sharing that. And that was Gazing Out Within and Ars Poetica by Kathy Gibbons. I, I'm, I'm really enjoying this um, prompt. It, it kind of... Um, you know, voyeuristically looking out of everybody's windows is pretty fun. Um, <laughs> it is, it is. And yeah. thank you for Alejandro. He was one. I loved, I have to mention that one of my favorite things he said was about how he loved um, introducing his son to guns because of the cleaning of the guns and the smell of the gun when it fired. I just, that just blew me away. So, yeah, yeah. Anyway. He, he's got a whole series of poems. It's really something poets don't write about much. So it's definitely worth checking out his book for that. It's like a like yeah. a chapbook within the book almost. Um, yeah, but thanks for calling in, Kathy. It's always a pleasure okay, to talk to you. Tim. Okay, good night. Bye. Okay, let's see. Next up we will have Cameron Gray. I'll find Cameron's poem while it's ringing. Um, I know I saw it. Oh, there it is. Hey, Cameron, it's Tim with Rattle. Did you want to share your poem tonight? I did. Um, let me um, let me put it in a document so I don't show your... Yeah, I do it on my phone. <laughs> I don't have the... No, it's no problem at all. I, I just have to... I don't to, have the um... technologies. I realize you have to do that every time, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's no problem. I just I forget to open up the word, a blank Word doc, and then um, uh, it's just a matter of pasting in once I do that. Okay, so there it is. This is... Um, um, this is the Lady Barb. Is there anything you want to say before you start? Uh, no, this one's pretty much self-explanatory. Okay. It's looking out my kitchen window. It's the only thing I can see is my neighbor's house. <laughs> <laughs> well, go ahead. The Lady Barb. Her grass is never allowed to grow, and her hair is never long. Everything a place, a unique space. The flowers know where they belong. Her accent is German, and I must confess, I grab every chance to hear her speak. Sometimes she keeps a herd of children who she lets run and play in the street. Charlie is her dog. He waddles over to me. She is on him in an instant. All apologies. Who could ever be mad at these two? Both of kind nature and cool philosophies. Her car is always coming and going. I wonder, when does she sleep? 
the lady Barb, so sharp and neat, the only name I know on my street. Oh, that was great, the lady Barb. Thanks so much for sharing that. That was um, mm. uh, reminiscent of um, what's that that poet who um, wrote the whole book of townsfolk. I love. No. Yeah, yeah. What I don't it? know. Tell me. Yeah, <laughs> I'm drawing a blank on the name right now. Um, but anyway, someone in the comments will know. But the lady Barb. I'm glad to meet the lady Barb tonight. Thanks so much for sharing that, Cameron. Oh, okay. Thank you. Have a good night. Yeah. You too. Okay. Let's see. Let's do Jessica Dawson. Hey, Jessica, how are you doing tonight? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm good. And with yours, we have a, a picture and a poem. The actual picture <laughs> yeah. out the window. <laughs> With my, uh, my one of my cat's heads blocking it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I'll show this on the screen for everybody, too, so everybody can, can see Jessica's cat. There you go. Um, so, um, so is there anything you want to say about your poem before you read it? Um, I will say that I wrote it, and I was feeling pretty good about it. Um, and then I read it to my boyfriend, and he was like, um, that was good. And I was like, <laughs> oh, um, do you have anything more to say? And he's like, well... It's kind of depressing. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, that was a total accident. So, you know. <laughs> yeah, well, well, let's hear your depressing second story apartment window. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <clears throat> From a second story apartment window. My cats chatter through the screens at the rats, running side to side in the alleyway, hoping to one day know the taste of what it means to be a predator. The pigeons love to tease them in the mornings, cooing from their perch on the many wires stringing us all together. Over the way, my neighbor's half-cocked blinds give me an idea for a drinking game, or maybe I was just looking for an excuse to start early. I remember the first time my brother visited me in Chicago and asked questions only a Google search engine could churn out. What I wanted was for him to wait and ask them on the architecture boat tour we were going to take that weekend. Why would I know how many alleyways are in the city connecting all of our backyards, all the trash we tuck behind our brick homes that swell upon each other like bullies? He looked out the windows and saw the possibilities in the skyline. I looked out the window, and all I saw was myself reflected back, drained by his enthusiasm on such a gray day. <laughs> that is a little depressing, <laughs> but uh, that's okay, Jessica. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, can I... Um, so I originally wanted to write something peppy. I really did, but it's it's been freaking raining, and you know I'm just like moody now. Um, <laughs> but it did make me remember when my brother came up and um, he asked me the most ridiculous questions, like how many sidewalks are here, how many alleyways, like how tall is the tallest build, and I was just like, good lord, I've never heard anybody ask this many questions before. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Anyway. Where, where are you from? That that he was missing from. Um, we're from Florida. Oh, oh, that's right. I remember that from before. Um, well, you should tell your cats. Our cats caught a mouse last night. It finally <gasps> actually happened. So one of the oh. reasons I'm kind of tired today is because at 6 a.m. I stayed up late reading submissions, and then uh, at 6 a.m. I heard the scream <laughs> that my daughter had found the mouse. And um, so our cats have, I, and I think it's the older female cat that we have because the, the male. Um, Dante just stares and doesn't care, but but Dinah has wanted to catch one for a while, and uh, she caught one last night. That's so. actually good for your cat. I mean, that's a really big thing for them. You know, I feel bad that ours can't like go out and attack. Yeah, well, it's not nice. I mean, I hope it's the, we had a mouse like four or five years ago that she caught, and it's nice to know she's still, um, you know, still able to at her. She's like she sixteen or it. seventeen. Yeah, yeah, but I hope that it, that was the only one. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, what a what a horrible thing to wake up to, oh, though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But anyway, um, thanks for sharing your poem, Jessica. Yeah. Thanks. Have a great night. You too. Um, let's see. Who shall we do next? Um, and I don't know if we're gonna get to everybody today. It's a very long. Well, let's try to do like a. We'll try to do it quick, and we'll try to get to everybody. Next up is Brent. Brent Stoffer.
Hey, Brent, how you doing? Hey, good. Um, let me finagle. That, does that have it? Can you hear me? Yep, it's better. It was really quiet at first, and then whatever you did made it a regular volume. Oh, okay. Okay, it just took a while for it to come, come around. Yeah. Okay, so Suburban, we're going to try to go quick. Suburban Eclog. Is there anything you okay. want to say about it? All right. Yeah, uh, not not really. I except that I, I kept I kept waiting for uh, for it to turn uh, and become ironic or or have some sort of bigger message, but it, it never did. So <laughs> it's just a little poem about what I was looking at. Okay, cool. Well, let's so, hear it. All right, um, suburban eclogue. The great green expanse of backyard rolls away from the sun dazzled house. Thick grass yawns past the pine trees and rolls down to the vegetable garden by the chain link fence stretching like the outflung arm of some damsel. A black greyhound, slender as a wrist, meanders through the clear open spaces. The sun begins to hunch his shoulders. Shadows flow uphill toward the window. Behind the glass, in air cool as watermelon, from the elbow of the disheveled writing desk, I survey the summer scene. Maybe later I'll take a smoke for an evening walk, when the dog's been put up and the moon has begun to pry apart the dark pine needles. Excellent. Thanks so much for that. Great descriptions in that poem. That was Brent Stauffer with Herb, Suburban Eclog, which is a word I never heard, Eclog. Interesting. Yeah, it's it's that it's it's an ancient form like I think it's Roman Interesting, huh? or 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 Greek and usually it's about a shepherd and it's all very pastoral and idyllic and um gosh there was one dude who was like famous for it and and uh, I think he was Roman maybe hmm. yeah, yeah it's, it's 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 a form or a genre yeah that's interesting I'll have to check it out but yeah thanks for sharing that and, and teach me something I right. appreciate it Awesome. Thanks, Tim. Right. Okay. Um, let's see. So how many do we have left? We have uh, Michelle, Joy, uh, Brenda, Danny, Gail. Okay, so we have like five more people. Let's just try to do get them all. Let's get everybody. Um, this is Joy Stahl. I'll find Joy's poem. Phone is ringing. Getting her poem ready. Hey, Joy. Thanks for uh, for sharing a poem. Um, is there anything you want to say about it before you dive in? Uh, just that I cheated because <laughs> instead of writing about my neighbor's house across the street from my house, I wrote the fence I see out my classroom window. Well, that that counts, I think, definitely. I mean, you, if you you live in your classroom a lot of the time, so go ahead, go <laughs> read it whenever you're ready. All right. The fence I see out my classroom window. Weather warped wood, pale planes planks, sticks side by side. In autumn unadorned, in winter snow capped, in spring bud draped, in summer unobserved. I love that ending. Nice little poem. Thanks for sharing that, Joy. That was Joy Stahl with Thanks. The Fence I See Out My Class Window. Thanks, Joy. Thank you. Bye. Okay, let's see. The next was Michelle Parks. Ringing for Michelle. Hello. Hey, Michelle, how are you doing tonight? I am awesome, Sauce. Um, and is there anything you want to say before you read your poem? Yeah, you talked to other prompt was about looking through the window and it made me think of glass. And there's this game I've been playing since I was in my 20s. Mm -hmm. um, and it's really great with people under the influence because you have to find like the specific criteria of the commonalities. Um, but just thinking of it made me laugh. So <laughs> it's called. Secret. OK, well, let's hear it. It's, it's ready. Okay, there's a wall here and a door. No ceiling but a roof. No carpet but a floor. Wood but no fire. And a pool but no water. There's a puppy but no animals. Rabbits in the grass. There's no vegetation, yet trees are tall or small. 
never big or large or dancing in the wind. There is no wind but hurricanes, monsoons, and drizzling. No rain. I don't thirst or starve. I am always fulfilled. There is no emptying, no pain, no desperation. There is sadness and happiness, never peace, not even wishes. I am not here. I am pressed to be glass, green without breaking. Oh, another great poem. Great ending, too. Thanks for so much for sharing that, Michelle. That was Secret by uh, Michelle Parks. Hey, okay, thank you. Hey, thanks. Good night. Bye. Okay, um, let's see. Try to get through... We have Brenda, Danny, and Gail left. Let's call it Brenda. Phone's ringing, and I got Brenda's poem ready across the way. Hello. Hey, Brenda, how are you doing tonight? Good, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Um, is there anything you want to say before you read your poem? I did bend the rules slightly, and this is not out my window, but out my front door. I, I think that counts. I think any kind of um, frame, frame that you look through counts. Um, so, okay, good. So go ahead. <laughs> okay. It's across the way. A beautiful, sorry, a beautiful late summer day, and the front door is open, letting the breeze through. The neighborhood has changed. Lounging in my living room, I see dappled sun on the McMansion across the street. There was a shack before. A small pandemic gathering is in the yard, laughing in each other's company again. Four rooms bursting with family. The new neighbors are nice enough. He says hello as he takes out the trash. She comes and goes with paint swatches in hand. Nana Lorraine would come and rock my baby. It was winter when they moved in. I told them about the peach azalea by the fence. When old Joe retired, he sold out to a developer. The large home fills the lot with a garage, sloped yard, elegant steps to a portico. He mulches around the azalea. Oh, very nice. Thanks for sharing that. Um, <laughs> the McMansions. There's that website, um, <laughs> McMansion Hell. Have you ever seen that? Um, where it's no. just some blog where he just makes fun of... Um, McMansions and the different architectural travesties that go on with those. Um, yeah. But, but anyway, across the way, thanks so much for sharing that, Brenda. Thanks. Have a good night. You too. Okay. Um, so two people left. We have Danny and Gail. Call up Danny first. He's got first day of fall. That was quick. Hey, Danny, how you doing tonight? I'm doing good, man. Yeah. You're going fast tonight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to, to get through everybody. Um, at some point, I'm going to have to like, like filter and, and not be able to get to everybody, but as long as I can. i got a two-hour time limit, and uh, as long as we can get it all in, I want to. So, um, so what do you have? It's hard to be that, that popular, huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's nice. Um, so, so you have first day of fall. Is there anything you want to say about that? Um, it's like the others, it's a compression of a couple of days and it's outside my door and it's, it's a true story. So <laughs> <laughs> great. Well, let's hear it. Shirtless, as all, as all yeah. my poems are. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, let's hear it. True to me, true, true, true to me. Shirtless, my next door neighbor's broad backside looks like a vacant billboard reflecting an attentive sun. In a distant phone voice, he says, He's not trying to kill his mother. After his words, a murder of crows, call, open acrimony in perfect time. Winter is coming. Winter is coming. Shocked by what I heard, I draw in one more stiff whiff of probability from the disquieted mountain air. As he walks towards me, let me please stay curiously lost between the crow-filled oak trees that shade the whitewashed walls topped with a pure blue sky and a loose wire that hangs into uncut grass. Excellent. Thanks so much for sharing that, Dan. It was first day of fall. I love the way that it uh, it turns from humor to dark <laughs> like in two seconds. <laughs> I know. Yeah. It's a true story, Tim. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, I hope your neighbor doesn't hear this. <laughs> But uh, okay, well, have a good night, Danny, and stay stay safe. 
Yeah, buddy, you betcha. Thanks. Okay, good night. Okay, um, let's do the last. Let me let me flip through to make sure I only have one person left. Angela, join. Yeah, I think we got to everybody, and now let's get to Gail. Gail Hemmen. Um, not sure if Gail sent her poem. Let me see if I can find it. Hmm, the phone's not ringing either. Is everybody still there? Let me see. Yeah, we're still connected. Um, let's see. I'll try one more time. For some reason, it wouldn't connect with Gail. Let me try to connect again. Yeah, it's just not working. I'm sorry, Gail. And I and I share your poem, but I don't see it here. Yeah, it didn't work. Nope. Sorry, we're just not connecting. Sorry, Gail. Um, hopefully we can get you. Oh, oh, there's a different. I see. She's trying by phone, too. Let's do it that way. Okay, the phone's ringing, so we're just going to do it over the phone. Hi there, good evening. Hey, Gail, how are you doing tonight? Oh, I'm pretty well, thanks. How are you, Tim? I'm great. Did you email your poem to me? I can't seem to find it. I, I did, and I'm a little, uh, I'm sorry, I'm a little new, and I didn't uh, know that we sh could or should do that, so I apologize, everybody, and, and Tim. Oh, that's no problem. Um, well, do you want to just read it? Oh, wait, I see it. This was, um, oh, wait, no, that's not it. Okay, do you want to just read it, and we'll just listen then? Sure, sure. I don't want to make you do a, a search, especially toward this late hour. Um, gosh, well, it's been, <laughs> been great hearing everybody's poems tonight. Um, and a lot of times I look out the window and I was uh, kind of practicing, you know, the try, try looking in a little bit more in poems. So um, this is a window into it. Okay. <laughs> um, at her house up by the interstate, out the window, she sees a microcosm, it seems. My life staring back at me, still empty, as this, a road-worn Jeep rolls by with an American flag and Trump flag, all that they maybe have to feel powerful, like the date she had yes yesterday and last night were not quite treated right. The engine, fine but flag, years of a man's hurt lifted to brag, and a doleful refrain, look at what they have and they have, and after trying to lighten him up, thought she'd probably not want to see him again, and though she's without complaint, she's not a saint and was eager to get back home to her book and back into her own lane. But as she looked out the window that hushed afternoon and knew that moonlight would be coming soon and sat down on the couch big enough for two, she wondered if he was safe in his lane and if opportunity would cross her window frame. And turned on the lamp on the inside of her window pane, the inside, turned on the lamp light, lighting the inside of her window pane, a book lighting up inside of the frame. And went to close the window, but quickly, a spark from the day, two strangers at play, but for the day, and though happy to go their separate ways, she left it halfway open. Um, and before <clears throat> before she turned, noticed in front of the window an open road again. Excellent. Thanks so much for doing that. It was Gail Hemmen. With that, what was the poem called again? Uh, a Window Into It. A Window Into It. So, thanks so much for sharing that, Gail. Really wonderful. Uh, so thanks, Tim, for the opportunity, and thank you, everybody. Yeah, my pleasure. Have a good night. Thank you. You too. Okay, so let's see. That, that is everybody. We got to everybody tonight. Good job. And thanks, everybody, for being quick, too. Um, now, let's go to the um, prompt for next week. Uh, and it is right here. Oops. That's not it. That's it. Next week's prompt. September is Classical Music Month. Listen to a piece of classical music and let it inspire your poem. Once again, September is Classical Music Month, which I did not know. And uh, listen to a piece of classical music and let it inspire your poem. That's your assignment for next week. Uh, good luck with that. And uh, next week's guest on the Rattlecast will be uh, Greg LaSalle. Um, Greg's a, a formal type poet. Um, we published him several times in Rattle. His most recent book is The Very Rich Hours, um, which you can see on the screen there. And um, we will see him Tuesday, September 15th at 9 p.m. Eastern with Rattlecast number 58. Hope to see you then, and I hope you have a good night. Good night.